Good morning, Ordinary Life. I'm Frida Hale, and this is Ordinary Life, in case you didn't know where you were. <laughs> First, I want to uh, announce that if you do not get the email, will you please fill out one of these green cards? They're on the back table, and uh, we can get you back on the list or on the list originally, okay? We want to thank Casey Kelly for the yummy sacred cookies. So great. What a great selection. Yay. All right. I also want to thank all the volunteers who came yesterday to the Boynton Food Pantry. We um, gave away 80 rotisserie chickens through the generosity of this class. <laughs> and they all went, too. I wanted to thank uh, Callista and Wayne Herbert, Joel and Marianne Shields, Lynn and George Schroth, and Lynn's sweet son, Kevin, whose car still smells like rotary ch rotisserie chickens this morning. And Linda Fogg and Nancy Thompson for coming and helping with that food pantry. And we will do it again on the second Saturday of January. I also want to announce that downstairs there's a basket and bake sale that you came by that the choir is putting on. And it's to fund their trip to Toro Cathedral in England. So stop by and purchase a few baked goods and help them get on their trip. Ordinary Life is having a Christmas party this Saturday, December the 17th. I mean this Friday, sorry, sorry. December the 17th from 6 to 8 at Anderson Fair. The address is 2007 Grant, and it's off Montrose, kind of behind Texas Art Supply. Okay, map on the website. Um, bring an appetizer and a drink. There will be a cash bar and entertainment from 6 to 8 this Friday. Ordinary Women is meeting on January 6th at noon in the Fellers Room. We have a great program led by Callista Herbert. It's a participatory, I knew I was have trouble with that word, participatory activity on racial wealth and the income gap in the United States. We will meet, this class will meet next Sunday on the 19th, but not on December 26th. And then we'll meet again on January 2nd. So I have another sacred cookie. Say hi to your neighbors and we'll get started in a minute. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning. So how are you? Um, you know, I, uh, I love it on Sundays when I get to stay after class and visit. And some Sundays I can't do that because I have a job. <laughs> so I have to leave right after class to go across the street, across the plaza. I can get out of that habit. And um, if you are not accustomed to doing that, I want to invite you to go to the St. Paul's website and look at the opportunities during this coming week, not this week, but the, the next week, for all the worship opportunities there are during this last week before Christmas. That next week will be the last week before Christmas. We're having um, so many worship services, it makes Jesus dizzy. <laughs> there are two on Wednesday, communion and lessons and carols. There are six on Christmas Eve. So you can't say that you don't have an opportunity to go because there are a lot of opportunities to do that. Three lessons and carols and uh, three uh, communion services on Christmas Eve. So I hope you go. And if you have not done it yet, would you check and make sure that your cell phone is in the stun position <laughs> so that you will be notified if there's a call, but it won't notify other people. So, <clears throat> we're going to begin as we have been doing um, in silence. With our acknowledging that sacred mystery is right here and right now in this place.
So this unnameable mystery, which we call God, we live and move and have our being in, and at the same time, this mystery seeks to find expression through who we are and how we live. So no matter who you are, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. I don't know about you, but um, I love Christmas. I just love Christmas. There are a lot of things about it I don't like. I don't like the commercialization of it. I don't like it that it's pushed too early. Um, you know, the saying is now that if Christmas decorations are up, Thanksgiving cannot be far behind. <laughs> Except this year it was Halloween. They were up before Halloween. Um, anyway, the way our culture approaches Christmas is way too commercial, and now heaven help us. It is a time for even more intense political statements and posturing. You may have seen what this family is sending out for a Christmas card. Just days after the school shooting in Detroit, this Republican representative to Congress from Kentucky sent out this Christmas card, and the message on the Christmas card was simply, Merry Christmas, P.S., Santa, please bring ammo. And you see what they're po posed in front of, right? I have seen five such Christmas cards this year. You know, after some school shooting or other mass gun tragedy, some people will say, guns don't kill people, people kill people. Well, guns don't make Christmas cards like this. People make Christmas cards like this. St. Francis is alleged to have said, always preach the gospel, sometimes use words. I use t-shirts. <laughs> so I have this one. If guns kill people, then I guess pencils misspell words, cars drive drunk, and spoons make people fat. So today, what I want to do is offer some further reflections on a parable told about Jesus. Now, we know this parable is the parable of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. The parable is about breaking, uh, crossing barriers and healing divisions, and we'll talk about that. But um, the title that I have given this time today is Going Without While Staying Within. And before time is over today, I hope to make that title make sense to you. So this past Tuesday was the 80th anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Now, I am one of those people who is blessed or cursed with a memory that can recall things from when I was two. I recall the Sunday afternoon, I was four years old when we got the news on the radio that this event, which according to FDR would go down in infamy, had occurred. The country was just recovering from the Great Depression. Um, our family lived in a small two-story house in a town called Portland, Tennessee, which is just, just south of the Kentucky border, right in the middle of the state. Um, we had... Um, a victory garden in our backyard. Some of you remember that. My parents grew their own vegetables and things that we would eat. Um, and we were all called on to join the war effort during that time. Soldiers who were stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, which is just north of the border of Tennessee, would come down to Portland, Tennessee to attend our church service. And my mother would inevitably invite some of them to come home with us to eat. My mother was a good cook, and usually on Sunday we had fried chicken or pot roast. And because she was a good cook, those soldiers kept coming back. <laughs> they made friends with our family, and they brought me things from the Army encampment, which I'm sure they were not supposed to do, like huge weather balloons and uh, Army 
captain's hat and things like that. Um, I really hope to be like them someday. And what I remember about this time um, is that it seemed to me that we were all working together for the common good. Um, I went online and found some of the things that I would see posted in store windows and around town, both in Portland and Columbia. We had rationing going on. Sugar was rationed, gasoline was rationed, rubber was rationed, you couldn't get t tires. Um, fortunately, because of Jesse Jones, who was a member of this church, during that time, many of the industries were nationalized and we had artificial rubber come into existence during that time. Um, here's another poster that I remember seeing. United we win. You would not normally see that kind of thing in, in the South, but we did. And some of you might remember Rosie the Riveter. We can do it. And this one was the one that I saw over and over. Uncle Sam wants you for the U.S. Army. So this country and our world face some really deep problems. And we must not look away from them. We must not minimize them. I don't think we can say, well, we've survived worse. What has come to this country and to our world is a time for a commitment to an ancient idea that you see in this parable that is told about Jesus. And that is that we come together for the common good. Now you're smart enough to know that we live in a shallow, selfish age. We are in need of what we call in the religion business a conversion. A conversion from looking out just for ourselves to looking out for one another. And when I say one another, what I mean is not only the people sitting around you today, but those in that demographic that Jesus referred to as the least of these, my brothers and sisters. We need that in this country. If there was ever a time to hear and heed a call to a different way of life, we live in it. And as we will see, as we dig into this parable we're going to look at today, Jesus called people to a better way of life, and that better way of life didn't just benefit the people that Jesus spoke to. He intended it to benefit all of the people. That's one of the basic lessons of this parable. So as I've gotten older, I have gotten much less invested in religion. It sickens me that Christianity has become, for many, a religion that gives some people a ticket to heaven and the privilege to be judgmental to others. And as we're about to see in this parable about, about Jesus, what he called people to was a relationship that changes all other relationships. He wanted people to have a relationship with the God he knew and he believed that that would bring people into a better relationship with themselves and with other people, especially the most vulnerable people. And yes, even with those we think of as our enemies. So working for the common good has fallen into cultural, political, and religious neglect. Now, you might wonder, where in the world did Jesus get these ideas that he passed on? Well, some of you have read this book, and you notice the subtitle of the book. The operative word in that title is Jewish. Part of the first actual age was the notion as expressed in Judaism that you cannot separate your love for God from your love for for your neighbor, for your brothers, or for your, or for your sisters. Now, this is an axiom that is found in all of the great living religions. 
So the, one of the questions I would like to hold up for us today as we go forward talking about this writing we're calling John is how did we lose a sense of the importance and transformative power of this teaching? How did that happen to us? How can we reclaim an emphasis on the common good? How can we come together in this new war effort to embrace and enter into the teaching of the spiritual masters? How can we practice what we preach in our personal lives, in our families, in our work life, in the ministry of this class, in the ministry of this church? How can we put our faith at the service of this radical love ethic that is both faithful to the sacred mystery who at this moment, at this very moment, seeks to embrace us. How can we do that? How can we live for the common good? So with that as background, I want to talk about this parable, and then I want to talk some about how I think it is applicable to us. Um, and I want you to be aware that Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well is a parable. It's not a historical event. It is a well-crafted story where every part of the story carries significance. Now, there, there is a significant history in the Hebrew scriptures as wells being places that people went to to arrange marriage. Okay? It was the Hebrew version of tender. So to put it in the way of this parable, people went to wells, metaphorically, to put things together. All right? Uh, it's a place where healing is found, play, found. So I want you to keep that in mind while you listen to this parable. So Jesus had stopped at this place, Jacob's well, which still exists. Um, you remember the story of Abraham sent his servant to a well to see if he could find somebody to marry Abraham? You remember that story? I'm not going to go into it. It was a great story. And, and um, so people have been going to wells to, for this to happen. This is in the Bible many times. So Jesus goes to this well. That puts him in the role of the bridegroom. And he invites this Samaritan woman who comes to be part of this new vision of the new Jerusalem, the new Israel. Now, the woman who sees immediately what's happening cuts to the chase and asks, how is it that you, a Jew, ask of me, a female and a Samaritan, water to drink? Now, the history of the gaping divide between the people called the Jews and the people called the Samaritans is very ancient and very old, but they hated each other. Um, it's an interesting story. Uh, the, the hatred between these two groups was intense. We've got stuff like that going on in our culture right now, so keep that in mind, too. This is the reason that... One of Jesus' best-known parables, which we know is the parable of the Good Samaritan, upset the Jews who first heard it so much because there was no such thing as a Good Samaritan in the time of Jesus. So the woman's question to Jesus is hostile. Rather than answering her back in kind, he offers her an invitation. He offers her living water, which among other things has the meaning of that which nourishes and that which binds the broken back together. Now she, like many of us, when encountering a new truth, is dense. She thinks he is speaking literally and seeing that he has nothing to draw water up out of the well with, she continues with another hostile question. Are you greater than our, notice that word, our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? There's another statement of divide. 
There, she is claiming the patriarchal history belongs to the Samaritans. The Jews also claim that it belonged to them. So Jesus, once again, takes a conversation, and he lifts it up to a higher level. And he says, well, the water from this well will satisfy you for a little while. The water that I am speaking of will produce such wholeness that people who drink it will never thirst again. Now, the woman is intrigued, but she's still trapped in literalism. So she says, well, give me some of this water so that I can drink it and I won't have to make the trudge back and forth between my house and this well ever again. To which Jesus responds, go get your husband. And she replies, I have no husband. To which Jesus responds that she not only has no husband, but she's had five husbands and the man that she's living with now is not her husband. Now, if you take this story as anything other than a parable, you're going to think this woman's got a really loose sexual history. But this is a parable. And the symbolic meaning of this woman is that Jesus is talking about how the unfaithful region of Samaria can be incorporated into this new vision of an empowering community that he has in mind. So I'm going to quote Shelby Spong's book. This is about how the ancient religious divisions in the human family can be overcome in the new human consciousness that Jesus comes to bring. Then she wonders in the story if Jesus can help settle, she's getting the literal level, she wonders if he can help settle an argument that has been raging for generations about whether proper worship is conducted on Mount Gerizim in Samaria or at the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus asserts that God is far beyond that human limit by saying God is spirit meaning unbounded, all-permeating spirit. And all who worship God must worship God in spirit and in truth. So this movement, asserts the writer of John, transcends all the Jewish limits, embraces all people, and even those who were the deepest objects of Jewish scorn. So what about the five husbands? I want to read you another passage from Spong's commentary. The reference is to a passage in 2 Kings in which we are told that the king of Assyria brought people from five countries and placed them in the cities of Samaria. The king then commanded that a priest exiled in, in Assyria, be returned to Samaria to teach the new residents the laws of this God. But the people of Samaria were not faithful to that idea, but they rather bonded with the false gods served by the people of the five resettled nations. And these are the five husbands of the unfaithful Samaritan woman, symbolized by this, this woman. So this, um, this story is not about sexual immor immorality. It is about faithfulness to the God who draws us beyond human boundaries and human prejudices. So the woman says to Jesus, I know that um, the Messiah is coming who will teach us all things. And Jesus responds by using a phrase that is found again in another Jewish story, Old Testament story, the burning bush story. You remember that story? Moses hears a voice from the burning bush and he says, who, who are you? And the voice comes from the burning bush and says, it is I am who speaks to you. All right? So when Jesus responds to this woman, he says to her, it is the I am who is speaking to to you. That is, God is speaking to you through me. That is a very powerful thought that was appropriated by the Jews, particularly by Paul. Now, um, this notion, this theological notion, is part of what got me fired from teaching in seminary. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 
It is not I who speak to you, but God is speaking to you through me, which makes the event of proclamation sacramental, sacred. We are God to each other. We can be God to each other. We can have that voice to each other. And the Baptist just didn't like the word sacramental at all. I found that out the hard way. So, the best thing that ever happened to me. Or second best. So notice now, she goes off to her village, and she tells people what's happened, and they come back. She's the first evangelist in the Gospels. And she's a woman. <laughs> yeah. So this is a story. This is a radical story. That, because we, if we take it literally, we miss these kind of implications. So here you got a story where two important barriers are broken. The human division between Jews and Samaritan is broken. And then between men and women. So you begin to see a vision emerge in John of what this empowering community is going to be like. Now, you can't get everything in one story. So next Sunday, we'll pick up with a healing story, which is the sec one of the, it's the second sign story in the Gospel of John, the healing of a, a centurion's son, a demonstration of faith. But the, the beginning of this community of empowerment begins to come into view when you see a story like this. Breaking boundaries, healing divisions. And as I said, the healing story will come next week. Both are really radical, dramatic stories. Okay. You know, I, I, I really love doing the biblical work, the deep work that results in what you just heard. I love doing that. I love reading the commentaries and making notes on them and seeing what other people have to say. Um, but so what? What I've said so far today won't benefit anybody if we limit ourselves to the conceptual. Now, one of the assumptions I make about you is that you have or are willing to have a daily spiritual practice to begin to incorporate this kind of thing into your life. We have to develop the capacity to go within, to abide within, and if we do that, we will inevitably be led out, but not before. And that's, that's why the title, Going Out While Staying Within. Now, you might wonder, <clears throat> now some of you don't because you do it, but you might wonder what happens if you do this inner work. Well, a lot. One of the things that will happen if you do this inner work is that you will get an experiential clarity about what we mean when we use the phrase, or whatever phrase you want to use, for that unnameable mystery we call God. You will get an experiential clarity, not an intellectual clarity. One of the things Richard Rohr is fond of saying, Jesus was not about changing God's mind about us. Jesus was about changing our minds about God. So one of my colleagues says that the Christian theology that many people have been exposed to is like a Rube Goldberg scheme. You know this. You can follow it from beginning to end to see that one thing happens and another thing happens and another thing happens and then something happens. So my colleague says God sends his sinless son who awakens the cat, who bumps your heart, which upsets the cup of your heart, and you kill him, and the marble rolls down the chute, and God raises the sun, which spark lights a candle, which turns on the toaster, and God forgives you. <laughs> no. So that will happen if you do the inner work. You'll have a conceptual understanding 
a conceptual experiential understanding of God, of the sacred. And another thing that happens from going within is a growing awareness of who we truly are. We need, this country needs, this world needs, people who are willing to learn from the inner recesses and depths of their human heart who we are in God. It is said that the prayer most prayed by St. Francis was, God, who are you? And God, who am I? I think there are a lot of people who are unaware that, um, because I've not heard it publicly commented on that much, that the insurrection that happened this last January happened on Epiphany. You aware of that? January 6th. That's the 12th day of Christmas. When the epiphany, epiphany is supposed to be a time when the light of Christ is revealed to the world, to the whole world. Well, there was a revelation, all right, and uh, there wasn't a good one. Christian nationalism, the power of authoritarianism, the threat of democratic collapse, and especially the role religious groups had in what, in, in what is taking place. That's what's being revealed to us. These things concern me deeply. I hope they concern you. If we had a clear understanding of the sacred, which we will get when we get a clear understanding of ourselves, then we will have what everybody wants, which is a more just social order. Now, I, I want to be pastoral in my work. I know that there are a lot of people who are hurting in this church, in our community, there are a lot of people who are really hurting. And I also want to be prophetic. I want to take the Jesus we see in this story and use him as a model for how we can be. Now, most people who have any church exposure whatsoever have been encouraged at some point in their lives to have faith in Jesus. I don't want that for me, and I don't want that for you. Change the preposition and have the faith of Jesus. Is all the difference in the world between those two things. So I want to be really clear today. I am not inviting you to believe anything. I am inviting you to know, to go within and experience the ground of your being and how knowing that gives you your true identity. It means consenting to the faith journey that Jesus has already walked. And if your experience is anything like mine, um, your reaction to that is, uh-uh. And, okay. Kind of a mixture of those two things. Being Christian, though, is about having a relationship with the God of Jesus and having the faith and trust that this relationship will not leave us unchanged. So as I said, most people think believing and being Christian is about believing in Jesus. No, it means to share in the faith of Jesus. It's a cosmic declaration about the very shape of reality. It's the sacred in us that loves the sacred that is. And spiritual practice engages us in this recognition. Recognition, recognition, this re-knowing. It's something we come into the world knowing and then lose sight of. So genuine faith is not an affirmation of a creed. It's not some intellectual acceptance or belief in certain doctrines to be true because none of that changes your heart. None of that changes your lifestyle. Jesus' faith was Quote, God cares about what's happening right now. God, or whatever word you want to use, cannot be known intellectually, and I am sure that many of the Christian insurrectionists 
believed all the right doctrines that day. <clears throat> now, by the way, this definition of what it means to be Christian is mine. And you may wonder, uh, good grief, where does he come up with this stuff? Uh, it's not original with me. None of this is original with me. These are my words. Um, I wrote those. But this is based in Judaism. It's based in the teachings of Jesus. You can find it in the Bhagavad Gita. You can find it in the teachings of Buddha. You can find it in any living religion. Um, they, these words are just a recasting of what Jesus taught. It's what all the great mystics have taught. Now, you have heard both Holly and me refer to the Christian mystic known as Meister Eckhart. So 11 years ago, Sherry and I went to a conference where Jim Finley was teaching about Christian mystics and mysticism. And we had been given ahead of time a bibliography of books to read, sermons by Meister Eckhart, and commentaries about Meister Eckhart. And I think I bought about four or five of those and tried to read them before we went to Albuquerque. And I will tell you right up front, I couldn't do it. I could get to page three, and then I just brain fog. I just couldn't get it. I remember uh, one of my first spiritual directors suggested that I read The Cloud of Unknowing. Has anybody in here tried that? It's hard. It's hard. It is a hard book to read. Um, I got to page three, and I just said, I can't do this. So that same thing happened to me when I tried to read Meister Eckhart. It just was too hard to do. So um, I complained to Jim Finley about this. And uh, so he gave me some advice about how to approach this. And uh, I listened to what Jim Finley said. And I said to myself, I didn't say this out loud, there's no way in hell I'm going to do that. <laughs> that is not going to happen. But I thanked him just the, just the same. You know, I've often thought about people that I admire so much. Among them, Ilya Delio, Jim Finley would be in that group, Richard Orr would be in that group, and I've thought about, I'm simply not willing to do what they've done to be where they are. They've all led cloistered lives. Uh, Finley did get married, but, but uh, Ilya and Richard Orr never have married. Um... It's a lifestyle that I couldn't, couldn't do for myself. I've just not been willing to do that. Um, but I'll tell you the advice that Finley gave me. He said, um, take a commentary on Eckhart's work and read a paragraph of it. And then write down in a notebook that paragraph in your own words. And then go back to the next paragraph and read that. And write that down in your own words. And then go back to the next paragraph and read that until you finish the book. And I looked at him and I said, thanks, Jim. Very helpful. <laughs> and walked away. Yet, what kind of teacher would I be to you if I had a teacher whose advice I didn't follow? So some months ago, I began going through a commentary on the work of Eckhart, writing down a paragraph at a time. I finished last weekend. I got to tell you, it works. It works. It is work, but it works. Now, you might wonder why Eckhart. Well, uh, Finley highly recommends him. Carl Jung, whose work, Psychological Path I Follow, Carl Jung was smitten with Eckhart. And many others are saying that right now he's the guy to listen to because he lived in a time very much like the time when the Gospel of John was being written and very much like the time that we live in, a time when an old order was coming to an end and a new order has not yet been put in place. And so... I styled this a few years ago, living between the no longer and the not. You know, it's the apocalyptic time. It's a time of chaos. It's a time when everything is up for grabs. Now, Eckhart was no psychologist. He was a monk. But his writings are clear 
about the need we have to explore the inner depths and to know ourselves before we do anything else. When the outer world is in chaos and crisis, it is only by returning to the human heart, by returning to the self, that we can resolve the crisis. Eckhart was clear that if we do not find God within, we will not find God anywhere. And if we do find God within, we can never lose God and we'll see God everywhere. This is our need. This is, the, this is our desperate need as a, as a society, which uh, gets me back to Christmas. Seriously, what good is the birth of Jesus if that birth doesn't happen in me? Eckhart wrote during a time, as I said, in the 12th century when there was much unrest and violence and injustice and insecurity. The same kind of dynamic was going on when the Gospel of John was written, and we live in such a time. And I believe in my heart of hearts that every person on the planet wants a just, equitable social order. Maybe not every person wants it for everybody, but every person wants it for themselves. Wanting it for everybody is what the message of Jesus is about. Eckhart says that this work is the work of a lifetime. Now, I don't know about you, but I hear that as very hopeful. It means that I can go to bed every night and write at the bottom of that day's page, more to come. There's more to come. There's more to come. I, 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 said, I love Christmas. This season leading up to the celebration of Christmas, Advent, I just, it's a time of yearning and longing. I told somebody before class, I'm looking for um, a Christmas hymn or carol that has the meter that I can insert the phrase, use your turn signals in. But I haven't found that yet. Um, I listen to Christmas music starting the day after Thanksgiving and going to January 6th. And now, to save my marriage, I listen to it on <laughs> earbuds. I found out, um, you know, one of, my, one of my favorite hymns was originally um, written in French uh, by Adolphe Adam in 1847. Keep that date in mind because that's important. And a decade later, in 1857, an uh, Episcopal minister, uh, John Sullivan Wright, Dwight, translated the French into the song that we know now. This is not in our hymnal, and when I mentioned that to Chris Betts, he said, well, the words of the hymn do not lend themselves to congregational singing. But um, <clears throat> you know it. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, oh, hear the angel voices, oh, night divine, oh, night when Christ was born, oh, night, oh, holy night, oh, night divine. <clears throat> I'm not going to take up singing as a living. And thanks to Shane Claiborne, I learned there's a verse to this song that we never hear. It is never sung in our churches. I'm not going to sing this, but I'll read it. Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains he shall break for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression will cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus we raise. Let all within us praise his holy name. 
Ever heard that? Why? 1847, 1857, what was going on in this country? And we kept it that way. So this is why I do this work. This is why we do this work to, to be free, to create a just social, social order, to come and to know who we truly are, and thereby to come to know and love all of our brothers and sisters, for they are us. And in the knowing of that, to experientially know sacred mystery. No matter where you go this week, no matter what happens, remember this, you carry precious cargo, so watch your step, and we'll see you here next Sunday. Thank you.